Right, hello. Um, lovely hire pupils. Um, it is me, Mr. Mitchell, and what I have decided to do this year is instead of just doing purely assignments, I've decided that I'm going to make some videos for you guys just to help you kind of understand things a little bit better. Um, often find that people hearing things and seeing things, um, it makes more sense to them. So we're going to try this. Um, if you hate it and it doesn't work, we could scrap it. But I thought it would be a good idea just for me to go through um, some of the topics and you can hear it from the horse's mouth. So what we are going to do here is I have um, added to our OneNote that already exists so you can look at all of these online. They will be updated instantly as I go through them. And what I want you guys to do is basically take notes from these. You can copy the whole thing if you want. You can take bits from it. It is totally up to you. You are higher pupils now, so you decide how much or how little you want to write down. What I would say on that note is that I have already condensed quite a lot of notes already. So I would say if you want a nice full set of notes, probably best to just copy everything down. Now, what I am going to do is I'm not always going to complete the notes. Um, you'll see here that already there are some bits that are blank. Um, for some of these, I will go through and complete the blanks. For other parts, I will leave them blank and then complete them at a later date, a week or two later, so that you aren't being spoon-fed spoon everything. So you will have to do some thinking for yourself. It's not just going to be you sitting in front of the computer listening to me ramble on all day. Um, as well as these videos, there is also going to be supplementary assignments on Teams as well. So it's not just going to be videos the whole time. There will be additional questions for you to complete as well as um, keeping up to date with your notes and your learning. So... Without further ado, let's get started. Um, we are starting off the year with a completely new unit and a completely new topic. We are going to be looking at the chemical industry today. So we are going to be looking at um, really what is the chemical industry. You've probably heard of um, industry as in terms of like factories and um, kind of adult jobs, but like what, what do we actually make? What is it used for? Um, why is it important to our everyday lives and why is it important to you? Because um, it very much is. So, um, yeah, we're going to start with a few definitions as, um, as well as a little explanation of what chemical industry is. So, industrial processes um, are designed by um, engineers and by chemists and they make most of um, the chemicals that we use today. Okay. Everything from medicines to your phone to um, plastics or pretty much anything is made or has a part of it is made from chemical industry. Now, obviously, the people that make these um, products are companies, so they are in it to make some money. So the chemical industry, the way that it works really is that things are designed in such a way that it maximizes profit profits while also trying to minimize any possible environmental damage now we're going to look quite a lot at how they do that um, in this video today so just a few definitions first of all um, that you need to know and you need to understand these um, otherwise your life will become very difficult when you're talking about chemical industry um, raw material so, um, raw material, these are materials which have been taken from, and they are taken from um, the earth, okay, oh, let's try and fit it in, there we go, um, and they are in their natural form, okay, so these are things like ores, okay, um, or things like water, okay, they have been literally scooped out of the ground or scooped out of the ocean, they have not been tampered with in any way they are as they occur naturally okay so they are taken from the earth and they are in their natural form they have not been processed in any way shape or form um the next one that we're going to look at is a feedstock okay so you'll see this word feedstock come up quite a lot now these are substances which are derived from um our raw materials that we've just spoken about okay so these were raw materials and sometimes actually 
are still the same thing. So raw material. So these come from raw materials, um, but they sometimes undergo a process which prepares them for use in the chemical process. Now, for things like water, okay, um, water could be a raw material and a feedstock, okay, because you don't really have to do anything with water before you react it. But for example, if you wanted to use iron in a chemical process, you would have to get that iron ore and you would have to take that raw material, which is the iron ore, you would have to process it to get the feedstock, which would be iron out of that to then use. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about sustainability. So we need to know what it means if something is um, sustainable. So if something is sustainable, it is a material or process which causes little or no damage to the environment. Okay. And therefore it can be continually used for a, a long time or an indefinite time. Okay. So it's not a short term solution. It's something that you can be done again and again and again and again because it should have minimal or no effect on the environment and it should be able to keep going and going. You should have enough material to keep it running as well. Um, so if something's recyclable, you probably know this one because it's we use these sorts of words all the time now. Um, so materials which can be reused multiple times after um, being chemically treated. So sand that can be reused is recyclable. Now notice um, that last bit there says after being chemically treated. So that is um, quite relevant in terms of things. If you think about paper, for example, we recycle paper all the time, but we have to clean the paper and we have to take the ink off of it or we have to shred it or turn it into a different form. Okay, You can't just reuse it right at the end. You have to normally do something to it to allow it to be um, reused. That's why it's called recyclable, not reusable. Okay, there is a slight difference there because you have to treat it in some way. The next word is yield. Okay, so we're talking about the quantity produced by a process. Um, so that could be yield of a material or a product, or it could be yield in terms of profit, um, like money, monetary values. So um, when we're talking about yield, we're talking about quantities. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. So the quantity produced. Um, and the last word that we need to know about is byproduct. Now, probably a word that you've come into contact with before um, it is a material or a substance which is produced as a result of a industrial process. It is not necessarily the desired material or the end goal, but it could also be used um, and sold onwards, or it could be used in another chemical reaction. Okay, so byproducts aren't always useless okay sometimes they are but in the chemical industry because we are trying to maximize profits we obviously want to use the byproducts if we can so um it's another material or substance um, i'm just going to use the word material because we've used it later on so another material that is produced as a result of an industrial process yada yada okay so I'm just going to put these back up and let you copy them down. Obviously, pause these videos at any point, re-watch them, re-listen. Um, and obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email or um, post on the team and ask any questions. Chances are, if you have a question, somebody else will be thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know what that means either. So please do ask. Um, the next thing we're going to look at that you do definitely need to know are factors which affect designs of chemical industries. So um, definitely takes into account some of our definitions that we were looking at before. So some of the things we have to think about when we are creating a industrial process, if we are setting up a plant and we are setting up a new chemical reaction, we're trying to make something new. We have to think about um, the availability, sustainability and cost of our raw materials that we need for it, okay, or our feedstocks. So it's this, it's the reactants, the stuff that you need. You have to think about, okay, well, is it available? Can I get it 
a lot of it for a long time or whether it's going to run out and how expensive is it. So you don't really want to design a process that uses a really, really rare metal because that's not very available. It's also probably going to be really expensive and because of those two, not very sustainable. Um, as well, you have to think about um, where you are going to do this reaction. So for example, if you are doing a chemical process that needs a lot of water, you are not going to set up your plant in the middle of a desert because there's no water available and it would cost a lot of money to get the water to you in the middle of the desert. So you have to think about these sorts of things, the availability of them, okay? You also have to think about um, opportunities for recycling of materials. So the more that you can recycle your materials, the more money you save. If you can reuse your byproducts or if you can reuse, um, for example, water, if you use water to cool it in any way, you can reuse that water. So if, if there's any opportunities for recycling, you take them, you use them. Um, energy requirements to power the process. You are not going to want to design a chemical reaction that, that needs lots and lots of heat, for example, because you have to somehow heat it up. How do you heat it up? You've got to either get lots and lots of fuel and burn it, or you've got to um, power some sort of electrical heaters, okay? Same with um, an experiment that needs to take place at really cold temperatures. You don't want extreme temperatures, hot or cold, because you either have to heat it up or you have to cool it down. Um, room temperature is the best to go for, really. So you have to think about things like that. Also, if you are doing a process that requires electricity, I mean, you don't want to be paying lots and lots of money for electricity all the time. So think about your energy requirements that you need. Um, marketability and uses of any byproducts, like we were saying before, um, some chemical reactions make other materials. If you can get a reaction that will make a useful byproduct that you can then sell or reuse, bingo, do that one. And lastly, yield as well. You have to think about how much of this product are we making? So <coughs> you don't want to use a really inefficient reaction. You want to try and make as much as possible, okay? Um, environmental factors that you have to consider as well. You don't want to be producing a lot of waste um, and you want to avoid the use of toxic chemicals. Obviously, if you're producing a lot of waste and a lot of toxic waste, the surrounding area from your plant is going to be absolutely ravaged and completely damaged and people are not going to be happy about that. You will destroy natural habitats and wildlife and no, that's a big no-no. Um, you also want to look at if you're designing um, products whether they will biodegrade or not we have a massive massive problem with plastics just now because of this um, we did not design our chemical industry very well in production of plastics and now we have a massive massive problem that plastics is one of the biggest polluters of the environment worldwide so you really need to think about what is going to happen to these chemicals and these materials that you make after you've made them it's all well and good to make them but will they will they break down will they pollute once they have been used and thrown away so you have to think about um the long-term effect of what you're making and also um if you are making something that's biodegradable you need to know what it's going to break down into it's no good making something that will break down if it breaks down into something that's poisonous because then you've got another problem on your hand so all of these things are, are all things that we have to think about when we are um, designing a chemical reaction. Okay, so take a note of all those, make sure you've got them in your jar. Um, the next thing I want you guys to do is, I'm not actually going to do this on this video, but I want you to go and watch this video here. Now, the link is here on the OneNote, but that is the, um, the name of the video. You will find it on YouTube. So it's called What Types of Chemical Industries Are There? And it's by Fuse School Chemistry. So what I want you to do is I want you to copy these four questions into your jar and answer them. Um, <coughs> and what I would like you to do is um, make sure you write down 10 examples of different products that we can produce in any number of chemical industries 
I don't mind which ones you pick, but I want 10 of them. I want um, I want you to tell me what all of the different ones use because they all use something. I want you to tell you tell me um, what they all produce because they all produce something as well. And I want you to tell me what are the two main uses of water other than a starting reactant for the chemical reactions. So this last one here is actually probably um, the most unusual one I would say. You maybe wouldn't think of this one normally. So give the video a watch, answer those four questions. What I will probably do is I will get you to take a picture and um, send it or submit it if you want to. Um, I'm not going to be chasing people up for this, um, but I do expect you to know it. So it's really up to you. Um, you're expected to know it. I would. I expect you to answer the questions, okay? So go give that video a watch. Um, if you are on OneNote, you can just click and it should open it for you there. Okay. Um, the next bit that we're going to look at is some practice questions. So these are taken from the sheets that some people have used in study support, but you won't have done them yet. Um, so what I'd like you to do is I would like you to pause this video, have a read through the questions, and what I'm going to do is I want you to try them and then I'm going to answer them below where it says answers here. Okay, so pause the video just now, have a try at it, and then unpause and we will talk about what the answers are. Okay, right. Um, so this question is talking about aluminium production, okay? And it's talking about going from um, the ore, bauxite, all the way to making um, aluminium from aluminium oxide. So what it says here for the first one, it says, um, use the map to explain why um, Galway is a suitable site for purifying the bauxite. Now, at first, this wouldn't really seem like it's related to chemistry. This would seem more geography, um, and it kind of is. But this is really just a case of using your common sense. So, for A. Now, Galway is here in Ireland, okay, which is over here. Okay, now, what if you read it here, it says... Um, the bauxite is transported in 50,000 tonne loads by ship to Galway in the west of Ireland. So um, the reason why Galway is suitable is if you look right there, it's got a lovely, well, one, it's on the coast, and it's got a lovely little bay there that um, ships can quite easily come in and bring all the materials that you need. So um, it is a suitable coast, it is a suitable um, site because it's on the coast for ships to deliver the bauxite. Um, so anything like that you could write. Um, so I'm just going to put um, suitable because and I'm just writing this shorthand you would probably want to write it in a more kind of in a better sentence. I'm just trying to be quick. Um, suitable because Galway is on the oh that's supposed to say coast and is therefore good for receiving shipments of bauxite. And you could even say um, the bauxite from Jamaica if you wanted. Okay, so that's question one. It's good because it's on the coast, so it's easy to get to. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, B. What name is given to the substance obtained from the earth, like bauxite, which are used to make other chemicals? Now, we actually got the answer to that in our definitions already. So 
a material that is taken from the earth and it is unprocessed because the bauxite is just rocks essentially that is a raw material Apologies for the terrible handwriting. It may get better, it may not. I just have to live with it, unfortunately. So, C, what is the name given to a process material like aluminium oxide, which are used in the chemical industry to make other chemicals? So, you've gone from your bauxite, you've processed it now, and it's ready to be used. So, if it's been processed and it's ready to use, that is a feedstock. just like we discussed earlier. Okay, so if you got those as your answers, you were correct, woohoo. Question number two. I again would suggest that you pause this video and you have a go at it yourself first and then I will go through the answers with you just like before. So pause the video, have a read, Okay, so this question is talking about beer making and it is uh, talking about the process of fermentation, okay? Um, and it's talking about yeast, it's talking about um, sugar, alcohol, carbon dioxide. And the first question asks us, what name is given to chemicals like carbon dioxide, which are not the main product of a chemical reaction? So carbon dioxide is produced, but what we are looking to make as beer okay but carbon dioxide is made as well now what we have to ask ourselves is what was that word for that that thing again that is not necessarily our, our desired product but is also made now um, that's just from our definitions it's called a byproduct okay so carbon dioxide is a byproduct in this reaction um, B, explain how the production of carbon dioxide affects the economics of the brewing of the beer. So, it's saying, it's talking about these byproducts and it's saying how does the, how does the byproduct affect in terms of money? Okay, so if we're talking about economics, we're talking about money. Um, and what is, what's kind of an advantage to making this byproduct that helps the brewing of beer? And it helps actually make it a sustainable industry. And if you look, it's actually in the last sentence here it says the carbon dioxide produced is often sold to soft drinks manufacturers so what they're actually doing is they're being very clever about this they're taking the byproduct that they didn't necessarily want to make in the first place it's not their desired goal but they are using it to their advantage and they're actually selling it to make even more money okay um so um how it affects it is it produces more money because it they can sell it, okay? So you would want to write something like um, carbon dioxide can be sold to the food and drink industry or uh, to soft drinks manufacturers. We'll maybe say that to soft drink. Oh, big word and therefore increases the profits made in beer making Okay, so if it increases the profits, it makes it more economical, okay? So you could also add that in the end, makes it more economical. Okay, so that's question two. Should be fairly straightforward, I would hope. Um, the, la oh, the last question 
is a little bit more kind of complicated to read but actually no more complicated to answer necessarily you just need to kind of get to grips with it a bit more so i'm going to give you a second pause the video have a read through it have a look at the diagram and then we'll talk about it in a second okay cool okay so what i'm actually going to do is for question a i'm going to answer it this side here so that we can have the diagram still in front of us the whole time and what um question a is answering is uh, asking sorry it's asking us to see what each of the missing chemicals are so there's four missing chemicals and it's asking us to identify what each one of them are now for this you have to read the question properly okay i mean we are always telling you to read the question all the way through but this one you you cannot get right if you don't read the question so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to read it out um now it says this is the solvay process okay and it says the majority of the sodium carbonate used in britain is made by the solvay process in this process limestone which is caco3 okay is mixed with coke and air and heated so you can see that's this step here it says limestone with coke and air so this is heated and it makes two things okay we know from this it makes two things okay it says this yields calcium oxide and carbon dioxide so these two things are calcium oxide and carbon dioxide but which one is which we don't know yet okay so you have to be careful with this first step so these are calcium oxide and carbon dioxide but we don't yet know which is which because we kind of have to look at this next bit to find out okay um so it makes those two things the calcium oxide is mixed with water to produce calcium hydroxide okay so that actually now lets us identify which one this one is okay so it says the calcium oxide is mixed with water and that's water here mixing with that one to produce calcium hydroxide so we now know that two is calcium oxide so let's write that in there calcium oxide okay which means that three therefore has to be carbon dioxide now if you weren't able to figure that out there's actually another clue later on that helps you figure out that that one's carbon dioxide but we'll get to that later okay so um, the calcium oxide is mixed with water produce calcium hydroxide that's this part here calcium hydroxide okay the co2 is added um, to ammonium chloride and mixed with calcium hydroxide to form ammonia okay now that tells us there that this is ammonia okay because it's saying that they're your calcium hydroxide and your ammonium chloride are mixing to form ammonia okay so that is ammonia so one is also ammonia okay um ba -ba 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 -ba. ammonia is added to a uh, brine which is like a salty solution in case you weren't aware of what brine was um in a solvoy or solvay sorry solvay tower this forms sodium hydrogen carbonate which is here okay which is heated to produce sodium carbonate carbon dioxide and water okay now that tells us what is in here so what are the things that are being produced it's in the last line okay so the ones for the fourth one are actually sodium carbonate carbon dioxide and water all of them okay so let's write them in there so it is sodium carbonate and i'm just going to shorten these i'm just going to put co2 and h2 because we all know what carbon dioxide and water are okay now part b 
here. Okay. My reference to the flow chart suggests why the Solvay process is economically efficient. So when we're talking about things being um, efficient and we're talking about um, um, them being economically viable, we're talking about recycling things, we're talking about selling things, okay? Now, what in here is either sold off or is recycled or reused? So you have to think about what sort of byproducts you might make um, and how they are used again. Now, if you notice, we make water at the end here, but we also use water in the reaction. So water is produced as a byproduct, okay? But then reused in the process later on, okay? So what you could write there is the water produced as a byproduct is reused in the reaction. Okay. Now you're saving yourself money there because you're not having to go and get um, more chemicals or you're not having to go and buy more water because you're actually producing the water yourself. Um, it asks what are the raw materials used in the um, solvay process. So what do you start with? What are the raw materials that you start with? They are limestone, coke, and air. They are our raw materials. Simple as that. Now one th oh God, I can't spell coke. One thing I would say is it's um not Coca Cola. Coke is it's like coal. It's it's kind of a a different form of coal, a less developed form of coal, really. So it's like a carbon heavy, um, kind of, yeah, it's, it's light coal, just in case you don't know what coke is. So D, our last question, most of Britain's sodium carbonate is made by, oh, that's, um, I, I deem clone, never mind. Um, a large chemical plant close to the salt mines in Cheshire. No, made by SEL. That's a company name, sorry, I think. Suggest how this influences the economics of the solvoy process. So the actually the important part of this is um where it is. Now it's giving you a new piece of information here. It's um saying to you that these um chemical plants are close to salt mines. Okay. Now, why would that be relevant? Why are they giving you this new information? Why is salt relevant to this process? Now, if you go back and have a look at the process here, where, where do we need salt? Or where do we use salt? Now, if you remember before, it's here, okay? Brine. Now, I said that brine was a salty, like a salt solution, okay? So, if we need brine for this, we can get the brine using the salt from the mines that are near, okay? So um, the salt mines will contain lots of our sodium chloride, which is salt. And I'm just going to put NaCl, short for sodium chloride, um, which can be used, and we can actually even put some of our new words as a raw material. To make brine. For the solvay process. I should have just scrolled down. 
Okay. So, there we go. There's the answers to all of that question. Now, the next bit that we are going on to, we are, I'm going to set you guys probably some more of these sorts of questions to do on your own time. Um, but the next part, we are going to look, obviously, more at chemical equations and we're going to look at chemical processes. Now, before we do any of that, we need to make sure that we are comfortable in reading and balancing chemical equations because there's no point in us going on to talk about um, designing processes and um, figuring out yields of products and doing all that sort of stuff if we can't actually balance them first because you have to balance an equation before you use it. You can never use an unbalanced equation. It's an absolute sin in chemistry. It should not be done. So what we're going to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you to try and balance this equation. Okay, and we're going to talk about how we can then use it after. Okay, so pause the video here, balance that equation, and I will balance it in a second. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because this is all revision from National 5, so it shouldn't be anything like crazy new to us. Um, and I'm just going to go through the way that I taught my classes how to balance the equation. So if you weren't taught by me, you may do it a different way. Don't worry if you do it a different way, as long as you get the right answer. So what I would do when I would balance an equation is I would read the equation first of all, and I would say, okay, what elements are present? And I would write them underneath the arrow in the middle. So the first element I've come to is nitrogen, so I'd write N. Then we know we've got some hydrogen, so I'd write H. And we've got oxygen. So they're the three elements that we have present here. What I would then do as I would write how much we have of each on either side. So on this side of the equation, we have two nitrogens. So I would put a two here. We have two on this side, so I'd put a two there. Um, on this side, we have four hydrogens, so I'd put a four there. And we have two hydrogens on that side, so I'd put a two there. We have two oxygens on this side, so I'd put a two there. And we have one on that side, so I'd put a one there, okay? What I would then do is to check that it's balanced, these numbers have to match. There has to be the same number of the element on the left and the right for it to be balanced. Okay, So it's actually our lucky day. Our nitrogens are already balanced, so I'll give that a wee tick. Now we have four hydrogens on this side and only two on that side. So we want to get this two to be a four. Now the only thing that has hydrogen in it on this side is our water. Now, how would we get there to be four there instead of being two? Well, what we could do is we could simply put a two in front of that water there, which would mean that we have four hydrogens now because there's it's H2. If you times that by two, that would be four hydrogens. But it also affects our oxygen here. So there was one oxygen before, but now there is actually going to be two. So that helps us with our hydrogen and it in fact also helps us with our oxygen. And we can now see that that is balanced. Now, one last thing that you do need to be aware of is molar ratio. Now we are going to use molar ratio um, in the next video. So we may as well start working with it now. Now molar ratio is the ratio of our different reactants and products in relation to each other, okay? Now we've added a number in front of this H2O here, and that is called a coefficient, okay? Now whatever comes after that is times by that number, okay? So now for every N2 we produce, we produce two H2Os as well, okay? So same goes for every, every O2 that we use up, we produce two H2Os. Now that would mean that Basically, in front of all of these, there is an invisible one. Okay. Now, in chemistry, we don't like to write ones because we just don't. So, the molar ratio for this equation would be 1 to 1 to 1 to 2. Okay. You see where all they came from. So, that one came from there. That one came from there that one came from there and that two came from there okay 
So that would be the molar ratio for this equation. Okay, now you don't have to write it at the bottom like this. What I would normally do is I would normally put something like MR and then put one to one to one to two at the top. Okay, just because that's a little bit um, it's quicker, a little bit neater. Um, I'm just going through it quite slowly so that you guys get a chance to kind of catch up and see what I'm doing with it. Okay, so molar ratio, really important. Um, we're going to move on to another example just now. Um, so I want you again to pause the video and I want you to try this one for yourself and then unpause it and I will go through how to do it. Okay, so same as before, you are going to write all of the elements that you find which are present in the equation. So the first one is Fe, then there's S, then there's H and Cl. Okay, now I tend to write them in the order as I read them from left to right, but in reality it doesn't matter. You can write them in whatever order you want. It just makes sense to me. It keeps things organised. If you follow the pattern, you will always get it right. So there's one iron on this side, there's one on that side, there's one sulphur on that side, there is one on that side, lovely so far. There's one hydrogen on this side, um, and there's uh, two on that side, we're almost there. There is one Cl on this side, and two Cls on that side. Okay. So... Our iron, nice and balanced, we're fine with that. Our sulphur, nice and balanced, we're fine with that. Now, here's where it gets a little bit trickier. We've got two hydrogens on that side, we've only got one on this side. Now, how do we get this one to become a two? Well, we would want to times it by two. And the only thing on this side that has hydrogen in it is your hydrogen chloride, your HCl here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put a two in front of it to times everything by two in there so that we can get two hydrogens. Now it doesn't just times the hydrogen by two, it also times the chlorine by two. So we also need to double the amount of chlorine and that actually solves both of our problems for us. So this is now balanced. And if I was to write the molar ratio of that, it would be one to two to one to one okay because remember there's those invisible ones in front of all of these ones okay next one again pause the video try it for yourself and then unpause and I will go through it okay so again write down all the elements that you have and CL. Okay. So we've got two on that side, we've only got one on this side, we've got three, we've only got one, one, two, um, and we've got one chlorine on that side, and where's how many have we got? We've got three on that side. Okay. So First of all, we've got a problem with the first one. We've got two on this side and one on that side. Now we want to get this to be a two. So where could we times by two to get this to be a two? It would be this one here. So if we put a two in front of there just now and see what happens, that makes that a two, which lovely solves that problem. It would also affect our chlorine though. Okay, so we need to be careful. We put a two in front of that and we already had three. So two times three is six. So we actually now have six chlorines not three, not two or anything like that. We've got six because we've got our two there timesing our three. So that's maybe a mess that we've made for ourselves for later, but we'll see. Um, we've got three sulfurs on this side and only one on that side. So we need to somehow to get this one to be a three. So how do you get one to be three? You have to times it by three. So the only place that we have sulfur on this side is there so we have to put a three in front of that one which helps us it makes that one correct but it also affects our 
um, number of hydrogen. So we had two to begin with, and we're timesing it by three, which means we also have six um, hydrogens now as well. So our next one is to balance our hydrogen. We have one on this side, and we now have six on this side. Okay, so we've got one on the left and six on the right. The easiest way to get that one to be a six is to put a six in front of there. So that changes that to be a six, which is lovely for us. It also changes the CL as well because it's HCl and the six in front of that so it affects everything after it. So it would be six CLs as well. So that's it balanced. Our molar ratio for this one would be one to six to two to three. It's a nice molar ratio, that one. Okay, now the last thing that we are going to look at is these two triangles from National 5. Now, we should all know two triangles from National 5, and we're not going to use them yet, we're just going to go over them. But in the next video, we are going to look at using these um, triangles in calculations. So, um, the first one is going to involve mass, number of moles, and gram formula mass. And um, we know that mass goes up here in the top bit. We know that number of moles is down here, and gram formula mass is also down at the bottom. Now, M is mass, okay? And that is measured in grams, okay? N is number of moles, okay? And that is measured in moles. Okay. And gram GFM is gram formula mass. Okay. I'm going to write mass down there. And that is also measured in grams, which is quite nice. Now, the other triangle that sometimes people forget about a little bit is our one regarding our concentration and volumes. Okay, and that also involves N, okay, but it involves the letters C and V. Now, a lot of people remember the NMGFM with my nice granny, okay. For this one, I like to just remember CV as in a CV that you would hand into a, a shop, okay, because the word, the letters C and V always go together. Um, so that's how I remember that they're the two in the bottom because CV is actually is actually a thing. So, so N is again number of moles, and again it's measured in moles. Now C stands for concentration, and that is actually measured in moles per liter. Okay, now we'd write moles per liter like that. Okay, that's an O there, just in case it wasn't clear. Oh, I made that worse. So that's moles per liter. Let's try and fix that. M O L. There we go. And V stands for volume, which is in liters. Okay, which is just L. So we are going to look at these two equations next time and we are going to look at using them along with our balanced equations in calculations. Now this is all National 5 stuff so none of this stuff at the end should have been any sort of surprise to you. Um, if it is, I would recommend that you go back and look at some National 5 stuff and practice a few of these um, to make sure that you're confident with it because we're going to go on to use these skills later on in more difficult ones. So that's all for me today, but um, I'm going to set some questions and I would like you guys to have a go at these. Now, before I go, one thing I would like to say is that we are going to be putting additional questions and additional assignments up as well as these videos. So please, 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 please do them. And if you have any questions, please ask okay we are available for questions all the time we might not get back to you straight away but someone will get back to you 
um, and it will be fairly quick, I would imagine. Um, one other thing to mention is we obviously run study support on a regular basis in science. So if study support is something that you are interested in, doing sort of Q&A sessions over um, Teams video call or something like that, where you can type in questions and we will answer them, or we can go through some past paper questions. If you are interested in that, I will be putting a poll up and you can vote um, whether you're interested or not, and if there's any days that suit people um, or any time specifically. So if you're interested in that, keep your eyes peeled for a poll going up on Teams about that. Um, that's everything from me really today. So hope you all have a lovely week and I hope coming back to school isn't too terrible for you guys. Um, 2020 should be a better year for us hopefully. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.